welcome to my channel Life Law Fin. Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. I am especially excited today because I have one of my lecturers from uh, my LLB at Newcastle. So I have Dr. Helen Tyrell. Hi, Helen. Thanks for coming. <laughs> um, my pleasure. I, that's great. I'm, I'm actually happy that you're here because we're actually going to talk about the student as lecturer uh, publication. People are always looking for, for exciting ways to enhance their CVs and to maybe stand apart from the rest of their counterparts. And I feel like a publication is definitely one of those things uh, that can assist. But before we delve into it, um, I feel like we should set the scene a little bit uh, for, for our viewers and, and how this project came about. Now, I know from a student perspective, so I'll start from a student perspective, and then I'll ask you um, for some contextual background as a lecturer at that time. This was when I was in first year of, our, of my undergrad, and that was probably around March 2018 when there was strike action. Um, and obviously there were some heavyweight issues on the table, which many lecturers felt strongly about, and. Um, persons who are on strike. And the thing about it is we, we started to think as, as a student body, um, as humans, we, we can be quite selfish. So some people can understand other people's issues, but don't actually feel them because they're not actually a part of it. So some, some of the student body naturally were a bit worried about how we, how we would get our lectures. Uh, some, some lecturers left the materials um, on or some lecturers you know, felt so strongly about it. They just, they just said, well, okay, for that, that period that I'm out, it's up to you to do your, your independent studying. And honestly, I, I can't disagree with any, any person's method because that's your lifeline. That's your career that you, you have, you have some important perspectives on that and you have to do accordingly. So we did have an opportunity in, in public law, um, where Helen sent out this email and she said, right, I'm not going to be there because of the strike action, but students have an opportunity to participate. If they wish, you can come along to the lecture and um, you basically will be in control of the materials and delivering it. And I feel like that's the birth of, of, of how this, this whole thing came about because we went on, um, myself and, and a few other colleagues went on and, and we went and we, we basically stumbled through it, but it, I feel like we stumbled upon maybe a little treasure chest <laughs> because that's that's basically how our our uh, whole project started. Can you remember? Can you remember it as well, Helen? I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah, I, I was really surprised at the time that anyone turned up, actually, because I, you'll probably remember, but it was the first lecture slot of the day. It was 9 a.m. It wasn't uh, a warm day or anything. It was pretty committed, I think, that anyone turned up to that lecture in the first place, even under normal circumstances, uh, let alone when you've been told the lecturer is not going to be there. So it's a DIY lecture uh, as such, yeah. But I, I was really surprised, and I remember talking to one or two of my colleagues about it, and, you know, re reflecting on how brilliant it was that you guys had showed up. No, it was, it was amazing. I remember it like it was yesterday. Yeah, and I feel like thinking back on it, it was almost like um, we were stumbling through it a bit. We started started out slow. I remember Ari Arian. He loved it. He was like, you know, it feels good being up here. <laughs> you know, it feels good <laughs> maybe sharing some information. And I know what he. I know. I know exactly how he felt because it, it felt like we were really a part of of something. Um, and I think this is just the beginning of how we decided uh, to go forward with it. So I must ask you, you know, what, what were your immediate thoughts after hearing it? So you've, you've just listened to the lecture and you're like, okay, what am I thinking now about these students and what they did? I mean, two thoughts really. I mean, the first one, as a, by my just answer, well, the answer I just gave just now, I mean, I was just totally overwhelmed that anyone did it. 
because uh, I thought it was really brave actually and I wouldn't I don't think if I'm honest I wouldn't have done it as an undergraduate student myself so I was uh, really impressed that anyone would turn up and take on that kind of opportunity and that responsibility really because at the time I'd said you know not only will the lecture be there but the recording system will be going so you knew you were being recorded doing this lecture and then that's what I then reflected on later I got to listen to that recording to to hear what you were saying to see the slides go through and to see the lecture that I wasn't there to deliver and then so the second part of my reaction was really that process of listening to what you were doing and it it really took me back, not just how well you guys all did at pro progressing through material that you'd never seen before. You know, this was your first encounter with the material. It's not as though you were given this material beforehand with time to prepare. I just threw these slides at you and gave you my notes and you did what you were gonna do with them. And it surprised me at how well that went. And that's what got me thinking, you know, we need to trust students a bit more uh, than we maybe have been, uh, especially first year students who I think we we molly coddle a little bit uh, sometimes. We tend to try and wrap up first years in a little bit more cotton wool, just protect you guys a bit more, give, you know, not you guys, you're not a first year anymore, but, you know, when you were in first year, you know, to try and give you more um, and to, well, you have less freedom. And I think that this was an opportunity to see that more freedom could work, even at the first year stage, and actually to be part of that creative process, to be part of delivering some aspect of your teaching uh, could not only work, but actually add something. And that's where we started thinking about how we could take that on, isn't it? Um, how we started thinking about how we could give that to other first year students going forward in circumstances where there wasn't a strike, you know, in a normal year. So those are my two, two thoughts was we, we need to this is impressive and we probably need to do something with this. Yeah, I think um, just going along with that vein, I think me doing it as one of the students doing it, even coming away from it immediately, I was excited about it. I said, well, th this is new. This is quite novel. No one has ever, you know, entrusted us with this kind of material to kind of lead lead a session on it. Um, and obviously you, you have your colleagues basically saying some persons were saying, well, I'm not going to come. I'm not going to listen to you guys um, because, you know, I'd want to hear it from the lecturer. And I think it's really self doubt. It's really just based on self doubt. And the thing about it is it's I think we need to, to have a bit more faith in ourselves and the student body. And I feel like the student as lecturer just shows that we are capable of of doing doing that did doing just that and i feel like we walked away from from that venture evaluating the pros of it in terms of the confidence to do it um honing our articulation skills that kind of thing and also saying okay well there are some areas of improvement uh that we can we can obviously highlight for those students moving forward you know so i i i it's interesting to hear our immediate thoughts just after it. Now, I must ask you, Helen, why did you then think I want to collaborate with this group of students on this publication? Well, um, I think I, I, I never, it's true, I had never wanted to collaborate with students before. <laughs> uh, and that's not, that's not particularly because uh, it's just something I wouldn't do. It's just, it never crossed my mind as something that I would naturally do. Uh, I was keen, always keen on trying to work out how to do teaching in different ways or, or listening to different people's ideas. And one of the things that people did start doing and that I was aware of was collaborating with students. I've never really taken that on as something that I thought naturally I wanted to get involved with. But it was just because I didn't have the right opportunity the right project the right it, it just didn't come to me until this particular time when there was you know a small number of you to start with so the seven of you in that first lecture and six that went on to, to to collaborate over the publication so that's a on a practical basis a manageable number of people to work with but more importantly it was just you'd given something you know you you guys had shown something by turning up that day that you you had something to give that you could contribute something 
And it was something that I was surprised about. So you had something to show that I didn't know about in the first place. So I wanted to learn more about what was possible, about what was going through the minds of students at that time that I had lost touch with. So in part, it was really, you know, it was a true collaboration in that way because it wasn't uh, the lecturer as such trying to lead students along into a project for the for the sole benefit of the students as in a you know some kind of extracurricular activity it wasn't like that actually it was a, a real sharing of knowledge and perspective and I really felt like those of you that turned up at that first lecture gave it so well and gave it so confidently and just gave me so much to think about that I wanted to learn more uh, from you guys as well and and to learn how we could put our heads together and give that experience or, or something of it to other people so that's why I wanted to dig a bit a bit deeper. No that's that's really progressive uh, progressive thinking because I don't think every everybody would think like that so I mean we commend you for it and it's not every day that a lecturer would even think to ask us for our input um, to, to basically publish and I must ask then did you enjoy collaborating with us it's all over now but did you enjoy it? I did. I, it was, I think it's one of the, honestly, it's one of the things I'm most proud of in the last few years, because it was one of the things where I genuinely didn't feel like I knew, um, I knew where it was going to end up. Because we were trying something new. And so much of, you know, you know what academics do, you know, we, of course, we teach, but, of, and, and of course, we do research, but normally, we're in our little research silos on our specialist subjects. And we sort of know, you know the arguments we're going to try to make in the next piece that we're going to publish we it's nice when you have a big project where you don't yet know where it's likely to go but more often than not you do tend to know where it's likely to go how it's going to pan out it's not it's not always a true experiment you've usually already got an idea simmering that you then want to put out into the world whereas with this project it was it was you know the idea was much more in its infancy than that it was an idea about an experiment so we wanted to see what would happen and it was very open-ended in that way so our question really was what will happen if we allow first years to do this kind of thing in a normal year you know how will we do it will it work will it not it could have not worked at all it could have fallen flat on its face uh, we could have been reflecting on this in a completely different way at this side of it saying oh <laughs> it was nice when you all did it in that one time in the strike but actually when we gave it to other people it was a disaster so we didn't know where it was going to go and it wasn't something that anyone had to my knowledge uh, done before uh, to give students that you know responsibility of delivering something at first instance you know the the first exposure to a, to a topic is normally left to the to the lecturer and then it's only in a seminar or something that you guys would be given as students responsibility over any kind of presentation so all of this was so new that you know we we had to explore it and that's <laughs> that was part of the enjoyment was not knowing where it was going to go that's true and i feel like i should add at this point um our group was indeed unique because I am not a fan of group projects, but that was by far the best group project that I've ever worked in in my life. You know, we you always have the occasional shirker in a group group project or someone who's trying to ride the coattails of, of someone else. And I didn't at any point think <laughs> that any of us were doing that. I felt like everyone was being open, honest, upfront, and doing the part that they said they were going to do anyway. So I think that that definitely was one of the most enjoyable parts of the experience for me, knowing that there is still some kind of faith in humanity <laughs> that we can still come together and, <laughs> and work as a unit um, without frustrating each other. And we worked for a long time. We worked for about three, four years together over the entire mm -hmm. course of my degree and then my bar course here. So that's that's about four years working closely um, with each other and also working remotely because we used to, we worked in person for for a long time. And then obviously the pandemic came in and we still were able to to communicate, connect with each other, even though the majority of us had already left Newcastle. So that would that that just speaks volumes about the kind of work ethic um, involved with all the people in the project. 
And I haven't even started talking about the actual exciting work we were doing, the actual research and the seminar observations. And obviously we're gonna talk about the research me methodology, but I just think it's exciting um, that, that we did have such a hard working group. That's right. And I mean, that was one of the other things. I mean, it was so easy to collaborate with you guys. And some when I, when I would speak to other colleagues about it, there would be a bit of surprise at that, actually. Uh, not because anyone would doubt that any one of you individually would do the work, but actually that a group project with students like that could run so smoothly. It just never really felt like I was fighting anyone for, for work input or for, um, for any kind of contribution. It just it came so naturally. Everyone really wanted to play their part and everyone did and of course we understood each other's lives as well we're progressing at the same time so you know some of us were busier than others at different times but it just worked I thought really professionally in the way that everyone would say okay I'm busy at this time I need to do something here or you know I'll contribute to this part or I'll tidy this up and it just slowly but surely as a team we did just get it to the end. Yeah definitely now I spoke about research methodology let's delve into it so I know we we had to conduct our research and I remembered when you were dividing it up and discussing discussing the division of labor with us, you spoke about us going in and, and observing seminars and that that was mm -hmm. always exciting and interesting. But how did you come up with it? How, how did we actually um, brainstorm the best way to kind of research research this kind of novel way of teaching? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think research methods is, I mean, it's such a big question for anyone doing any kind of project. The basic principle is that you really want your findings to be reliable. And uh, so you want what you're putting out into the world to have some kind of sensible foundation, you know, some sort of trustworthy uh, foundation in reality, something that you can say, you know, this is, this is how we've come to our conclusion. And the crux of our project wasn't um, an experiment like a science experiment, but it was an experiment of it of a kind. And it was an experiment in the way that humans would behave when presented with a certain opportunity and the effect that that would have on the quality of their contributions or the, the nature of the work that they would do uh, throughout the rest of the year. So we had a couple of different questions to target in our in our project, I mean, you know, we aside from giving students the opportunity to stand at the beginning, at the, you know, at the front of a lecture theatre and present, we also had changed something about small group seminars to to provide more of a a presentation scaffolding, if you like. There, we you know, we we'll talk about it probably more, but we changed one of the questions into more of a debate question and and try to create more of a presentation pressure, <laughs> I suppose, uh, in seminars in that way. And, and that's what we needed to observe. You know, we needed to see what, what, what had changed since the previous type of structure to one of those seminars, or whether that confidence was carrying over into the lecture delivery and whether, and vice versa, whether what was going on in lectures was translating over to seminars. But the main question for those seminar observations and, and trying to introduce those was, you know what what's different in this year when we've changed the the way that these are working to how these were experienced in your year and what initial observations can we make those are anecdotal observations you know it's not very rigorous to to step into a few seminars and observe but from there we could you know we could elaborate we could take on some of those key questions or key observations and dig around a bit deeper so that was really an important part of the methodology, but really a starting part. The rest of it was bound up in what was happening in the lectures and of course a massive literature review um, on the subject of giving students that kind of leadership at all. Yeah, it's true. I, I do remember that because we, we even divided the, the literature um, and we had a, kind of like a spreadsheet on on what you know what each scholar says and that kind of thing. But I always I always quite enjoyed the seminar um, observations, you know, being out there in the field because I got to witness firsthand the difference between our traditional seminar, which is we get a few questions and then you come into the room and you contribute um, to an answer, which is really much very much dependent on if other students are willing to say anything, um, but 
when we changed it to the debate kind of question, I found a lot of the students that we witnessed were opening up a lot more. They were willing to engage a lot more. Well, you know what? I disagree with you because X and Y is, is the case. And I found it was a lot more dialogue than just the, the questions um, because a, a lot of the time, many students may be shy at that point. They don't really want to talk, um, but somehow the debate, you know, telling students pick a side and, and argue it or, or discuss it. Uh, it was it was quite interesting and quite exciting and as you rightfully pointed out it was it was kind of like a nice um basis for us to just kind of have a look around and then and then do some further research with our literature review but you know the key question here helen is people probably might be wondering how did we even encourage students to participate mm -hmm one in those seminar observations because that, that's a drastic change to move from just questions to saying what you actually want me to to stand in front of a small group of my peers and actually argue this and how, so how, how did we encourage them to do that and then how did we even encourage them <laughs> to to even give a lecture in front of 250 students <laughs> Yeah, well, okay, I'll take one out of the other. I mean, the, the first the first one there, the simple answer to the seminars, as you know, is that really seminars, we direct how students uh, should prepare for seminars. And so to some extent, we instructed students, we simply didn't give anyone the choice. Uh, they didn't have that traditional seminar sheet. They had, uh, you know, they were told you have to pick a side. Uh, you are either in Team X or Team Y on either side of this debate proposition, and and you're going to have to work with your peers in the seminar to present in this fairly rigid format uh, your point of view or your your argument. And of course, we explained the rationale behind that to students, and to some extent, we made that an instrumental um, an instrumental outcome. I mean, we sort of talked a little bit about how we needed to get law students thinking in terms of present, presenting themselves in argument, about how that would translate to written work and, and how it would ultimately probably improve their grade, which is uh, typically what strikes in the interest <laughs> of the average students, but certainly the average law student. But in reality, uh, it was about confidence, wasn't it? It was about giving students the confidence to to stand up and deliver a, a point of view that was backed by evidence and to put that skill together uh, from their research, from their seminar prep, to tie those threads together and to really understand what it meant to support a point of view with evidence in law. And uh, then that was a slightly different thing to sell, though, to the standing in front of 250 odd students in a lecture theatre, which is no mean feat. That is such a, a big ask of a, of a first year law student, but of any student and any person. Uh, if I'm honest, when I started lecturing, I was absolutely terrified of, of doing that. I, it took me a lot of courage um, and a lot of time to get used to that. <laughs> to, so, you know, trying to persuade students to volunteer in their first year of uni to do that was difficult but you played a part in that you'll remember um and i'm sure you can say something to that as well i mean you yeah. guys turned up didn't you in that first lecture definitely i was actually going to add that so i think part of our strategy was that we decided students ourselves we'd come and encourage them by coming to the lecture i think we took about 10 minutes 10 10 or 15 mm -hmm. minutes to basically present the benefits of, of why they should participate. And I really feel like by seeing us up there, I think it encouraged a lot of people to, to, to just tell themselves, well, hang on, I think I can do it too. Um, and how we did it was that we kind of divided the, the speaking role. So everybody got an opportunity to, to speak about it and what they stand to benefit. And I feel like it definitely did help because you, had some volunteers and this is the part of the project that obviously would be uniquely your perspective because after you got those volunteers you had to provide some kind of scaffolding or support mm. um, for those student lectures and I'm sure they would have been nervous so for you um, what what did you find worked in order to support them in the best possible way well, we, I mean, you all helped me with this as well, because I remember fondly a meeting that we had in one of the library rooms 
uh, when we were talking about how we would do this, how we would persuade people to do this. And this was before you guys had turned up and, and delivered your part of the lecture. And I remember us saying a couple of things, like it was important that they, that I wasn't there initially uh, when you talked about it uh, because I didn't want to add the pressure. So it wasn't one of my lectures initially, I think, that, that you advertised it in. I was sat upstairs in my office oh, yeah. <laughs> knowing, that, knowing that what was going on downstairs and just being ready to hit send on an email uh, which would follow up on what you were saying. So at some point, I think it was Darby probably in the lecture who was going to say you should any minute be getting an email <laughs> um, about this and then and then that's when I would email and it, you know hopefully work seamlessly but ultimately it was that sort of collaboration between us so the first part of it was you guys trying to set up that I wasn't uh, trying to be a sort of a scary or, or intimidating person that hopefully that they would feel that they would believe from you that they could approach me with this having not met me yet so that was the first hurdle and then the second thing was scaffolding once they'd come forward you know once they'd replied to that email where where we'd set out the opportunity and, and anticipated some questions uh, what on earth were we going to do to support them and what happened was I invited them essentially anyone who was interested I invited to my office and uh, we would have a discussion about what it involved and I would give them the opportunities or the options rather as to what they could present on so I had split up different segments of the lecture and I'd said you can either present on topic A or topic B or topic C uh, this would fall on this day this would fall on that day and this would involve roughly this kind of thing and um, essentially it was a, a bit of a buffet <laughs> and the students could choose what they were going to take ownership of and then I gave them my slides, my template slides from the previous year that I had delivered the material, which of course need, need updating year to year, but could give an idea of roughly how I might have progressed through the material. And then uh, gave some, you know, direction as to mandatory content. So there might be a case or two that absolutely can't be missed because they're the leading cases or um, unbeknownst to them because there's an exam question that is going to reflect on that material. But for some reason, uh, there would have been some mandatory content. And then uh, that's it. They, they were off and I, I perhaps gave them some tips on reading. But essentially, the students were and they were all brilliant with this, you know, and some of them may even watch this back and reflect on this moment in their lives where they were suddenly found, found, you know, having been given this enormous project, <laughs> it might have felt, but they went off and did all the reading and they prepared their own knowledge. They learned for themselves the topic rather than having been taught by me. And then they prepared how they would then re-explain it or reteach it to their peers. They had the chance to come and deliver it to me, uh, to practice it. I always looked over the materials to make sure that they were accurate. Uh, so the slides were going to be giving out accurate information. There were no errors, but otherwise, I really didn't need to do that because to be honest, they were so thorough. Um, they were so careful about it that I never needed to correct anyone. And um, that's the other part of this learning exercise is that even a first year student who's never encountered the material before could go off, self-study a topic and present it to their peers with a bit of support from the teaching team. But they could ultimately take ownership of that material and lead on it, uh, knowing that just that there was backup. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, what's clear is that it was quite strategic how we did it. So we came first, um, introduced mm. the whole concept to them you you weren't in the picture at all as yet because they didn't they didn't know you um they just they just knew that um dr tyrell was coming to teach them judicial review at that point or or sub, yeah some yeah i believe it was judicial review at that point and um we introduced them and then it was it was so strategic because then after you sent the email we decided as a group that uh, they had to build a relationship with you um, to, to present. Mm -hmm. So we kind of took a, a, a backseat role um, in that one. Now, I think it's important to just kind of highlight this point. From all our research and from all the student lectures presentations, they were all quite well received. And that fear that students had of, oh, well, you know, I'm paying X amount of money 
uh, for my course, I'm, I don't expect students to teach me or maybe they're going to tell me something wrong or give me inaccurate information. It wasn't it, it really wasn't a reality <laughs> um, throughout our research. As a matter of fact, as I said, they were all well received. They were it was accurate information. Um, and I feel like both both students, I mean, the presenter and the students receiving the information benefited a lot um, from it. And I think that was shown in our feedback as well. Uh, a lot of students said they they enjoyed it. Um, obviously, there were always areas for improvement, and but mm -hmm. I I always found that that never was something that cropped up after it was done, where students felt as though they weren't getting their money's worth. No, in fact, if anything, I think it probably went the other way. I think students were probably surprised. Uh, well, I hope they would agree, actually, because I have to say the one drawback to our to our feedback there is that we didn't manage to get an accurate sort of a, a full picture across the year group of how the audience all felt uh, in those moments. So it's a little bit anecdotal, but you know, we can reflect on certain things like there were certainly no no complaints. <laughs> I mean, that's a, <laughs> that's a lot of bar, but you know, nobody said, uh, what, what's this? Why are students standing in front of me in the lecture theatre? So, uh, and and most students actually aren't shy <laughs> about saying oh, when they don't think something is working. So, so, you know, that, that is a, a sort of a barometer, even if it's a low bar there. Uh, and then the second thing that was just so lovely was that the students clapped spontaneously for the student presenters. You know, and we I never get clapped in, in a lecture theatre. You know, lecturers don't get applauded. Uh, well, not at Newcastle anyway. I know there might be a culture of it uh, in other institutions, but it's not really the culture at Newcastle for, for students to applaud after every lecture. But they did applaud their peers. And, and they weren't shy of asking questions of them uh, from time to time. And I know that some of the students who presented reported back that they had been approached with questions about the topic from their peers. So, you know, that sort of points to trust on behalf of the audience to the, to the, to the students who had stood in front of them and presented. And that was, I think, the nicest part about it, that sort of sense of, we called it community in our final write-up, you know, that we thought it built a sense of community uh, between the students. And it changed that aspect of, of the formal hierarchy where it's always that the lecturer is the only person to be trusted to give the knowledge and that the students are really just the passive recipients of knowledge that's given by the lecturer. So that was, I think that was the highlight for me. I don't know about you uh, from the research project in, in all was flipping that. Yeah, that definitely was a highlight for me because I know, and, and I, I think we always knew even when we approached that first student lecture that we gave, we always had comments from those in our years saying, well, I don't know why you're, you know, you're wasting your time doing that. Um, it's, it's irrelevant, it doesn't matter. No one's gonna listen to you. You don't have any special <laughs> knowledge. So I'm happy mm -hmm. to know that it was just our group. Um, obviously, we didn't have it well planned out as yet because obviously the student lecture publication was born from it. But I, I was happy to know it wasn't something that that was critiqued or, or highlighted, mm -hmm. highlighted, you know. So that was something that I was really proud of to show others. Well, look, this can be done. Um, we just have to have a bit of faith in ourselves. We just have to trust ourselves to do that research and, and to present accordingly. Now, you know, I must ask, Helen, um, is student lecturing now a permanent feature on the curriculum? Because I know there was a time when we spoke um, to the staff about it. You really did give us quite a lot of autonomy and you allowed us to, to address uh, some of your colleagues on, on this whole project. And I, I remember it was well received. So I must mm -hmm. ask, is it is it now a feature of, of the curriculum? So it isn't this year, but it will be uh, next year. So it, everything was derailed a bit, as you can imagine, by the pandemic and by the upheaval that that caused to the way that we teach. Now, in hindsight, and we reflected on this in our write-up, we probably could actually have carried it through to the online teaching format, but it was... It just, there was so much going on, you know, and on a human level, it just, 
there was a lot for, for law teachers to grapple with in terms of how they now changed all their courses to be online, you know, purely online and, and for students to have to grapple with learning everything online, it felt like too much to try and add something else into the mix. So we didn't do it at all in the pandemic year uh, or years, <laughs> uh, really. And uh, this year has been a bit of a recovery year. And of course, I've been off because I've been on maternity leave this year. So uh, we've had a bit of a, a pause, I would say, in, in normal innovation, <laughs> although there have been some interesting and fantastic things that my colleagues have been doing with the new online learning system. Uh, we've not brought this back online just yet, but we certainly will. And that is the plan uh, because it did work so well. And because so many of the people that were involved in it had such a positive experience or, or told us that they did anyway. And it would be such a shame to not to not keep that up, to not pass that on. So I have every intention that when I'm back, you know, for the next academic year to really integrate this, not just into that small group of lectures, but throughout the course uh, and to try and give anyone who wants to in that year group the chance to do it rather than just, you know, a few people over a few few lectures, which was the experiment that we were forced to run. So I hope so. I hope it. I hope it really carries on. I hope it widens out into other courses and it certainly has reached into other modules. So into a third year module, uh, there is a bit more of a presentation element as well uh, as a result of some of those experiments. So yes, it has permeated and it, I think it will do further. That's excellent because I, I know the pandemic did this, did cause a lot of stresses on, on people. And obviously mm. that, that's something as you, you rightfully pointed out, that at that time it's it's more about coping and surviving <laughs> than than really yeah. trying to, yeah to push in something else new. But I'm I'm glad that our publication did mention the fact that it, it can actually work and probably work quite well mm -hmm. on an online platform in much the same fashion in, in in how we're using Zoom or how you might use Teams and the same way that these now fantastic tools allow you to share a screen, maybe slides. Um, it can can it can work really well. So I'm glad that we did still kind of address that um, in keeping with the times really and truly, because I feel like remote learning, it may be here to stay. Um, definitely in person is the way that we love it, but there may be some sessions that still have to, to go ahead uh, remotely. Now, for those people wondering, um, I, I must ask, the, ask us both the question, how can student lecturing improve the curriculum? How do you think, I know we've spoken about it extensively um, here, but in just a few spiffy responses, how do you think it can improve the curriculum for like a law school or, or anyone, really any university department who might think, okay, hey, we might try this. Well, I, have, I actually have, you'll be delighted to hear a short response here. I think it can make it more representative. So the more and more that we've thought about this, the more and more that we worked through our ideas and the more that we saw how it panned out, the main thing that came out of it was knowing that if you give students the opportunity to take creative direction uh, over the content of a course, you also get their point of view. You get their ideas, but you get their point of view, and which means you get where they're coming from. You get something about their view of the world. And that's not your view as a lecturer. Well, speak, I'm speaking as myself now. It's not my view as a lecturer. You know, when you stand up and say something, it's going to be different. It's going to come from a different place. And every individual person has got that different perspective to bring. And there are different types of people in the lecture theatre. And one of the big questions at the moment is how we do things like diversify the curriculum, how we take into account all of those different perspectives, all of those points of view, backgrounds, just understand more the different lenses through which our students see the world and see our courses. And I think this is a really important opportunity to achieve that, to give students a voice in their learning. Why not give them a part of it? I absolutely agree. And I, I just want to add something here. I also think that this kind of improvement or addition um, also helps in the job market because a lot of law students, some may want to pursue the bar, some may want to be solicitors, others may want to practice outside the law, 
But one thing that remains a constant is that you, you must be able to articulate ideas or express your thoughts in some kind of succinct way. And I feel like an initiative such as this definitely helps with that because not only do you start to build your confidence, um, but I, I feel as though you start to work with others well, you express your thoughts a lot better as well. And, and these are all skills, even in our research, um, you know, which we conducted, that we found a lot of, of um, schools, like bar schools, and a lot of employers were saying, well, we, we still find that there's a deficit in, in the oral skills coming from law students. So I think that it's a, it's a massive need because it's surprising. Some people may be surprised to know that there's still quite a lot of us that are shy even doing that law course, we're not we're not sure. Is this really the place for me? I, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. It may be a degree that I might use, um, and because I'm kind of shy, I don't want to speak at all. And yeah. the sad thing is, it then starts to 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 hinder your articulation skills by the time you reach an interview, or by the time you try to apply for some kind of job, and you know the universities have to to receive that kind of feedback like we're we're not we're not happy with the with the students level of confidence and um mm. with their oral skills so i definitely think that's a big plus and it's easy to sit through a degree if you don't participate in extracurricular activities like mooting and those kind of things and generally not hone it and it's to me it's it's almost like a muscle that you have to flex if you don't speak right. often you, you're not going to get better. You really That's not. Going to get better. I was about to say pretty much exactly what you just said about the uh, the relationship between student confidence and those extracurricular opportunities. You know, because a lot of people assume that law students have a, every opportunity to hone that skill, to sharpen that voice box of theirs, but really. Students have to have some self-motivation in the first place, some self-confidence enough to be able to put themselves forward and out of their comfort zone to go along to the mooting, you know, introductory session, to sign up, to do client interview and to do whatever it is, or, you know, whatever kind of opportunity it is. Typically, um, if it's not structured in, into a course, then it relies on that student having that self-confidence or that self-motivation that drive to be able to understand the importance of that opportunity and that snowballs so you know if you missed it in your first year and then you sort of still feel a little bit behind in your second year then by the time you get to your third year you feel like other people have so much more experience than you and you just withdraw a bit more well, that's typically what some students will do so the idea is that we try and build this type of confidence building activity into those first year courses and to some extent we already do in some in some courses with some aspects of presentation we might do client interviewing as part of a course as we do at Newcastle actually but you know standing up in front of a room of 250 odd students it's just a different ball game it's just a different kind of challenge and once you've done something like that you you know you just can't be as intimidated uh, by the thought of standing in front of a smaller group, uh, even a moot court, you know, even a judge, you know, that kind of thing starts hopefully to become more approachable. And if we do it early enough, early enough in the degree, then the hope is that it carries on and students can build on that rather than constantly withdrawing further. That's true. And you know what? I just had a thought. Many students suffer from imposter syndrome and just now you were talking about, you know, not participating or, or you may have participated in, in a few extracurriculars like mooting. But the mm -hmm. sad reality is as well is that most of those extracurriculars usually culminate to being competitions. And mm -hmm. that has its mm -hmm. own kind of dynamic where, OK, I might not have advanced past the preliminary wrong or I might not have advanced past the semifinals. You get a bit of a knock in confidence and you tell yourself, mm, I don't think this is for me. I, I really am not that good. So-and-so is quite good. She, she won it or she advanced to the finals. And then we're back in that downward spiral of, of not volunteering yourself because you, you don't want to, because there's a, a kind of shame 
and and this is nothing to be embarrassed about but it's a little bruise to your ego that you haven't advanced and there are not a lot of spaces where you can just go and just say okay we're mooting for fun no one wins here Absolutely. you know yes yeah but, no, this is just a one-off I'll get some feedback yeah. you know yeah there's no particular repercussion as to as to this this is just a practice you know this is just a fun as you say a, a fun experiment yeah so it is definitely needed and i would encourage everyone to check out our publication i know there are a lot of people that are interested in pedagogy and i feel like our publication is cutting edge um it deals with something quite novel and not really not really very much experienced or experimented with and i think it's going to be exciting if a lot of universities um can take this on board but Helen, this wouldn't have been possible without you. So thank you very much uh, for involving us in, in this kind of publication. And, and thanks for coming. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I could say the same thing back, you know, it wouldn't have been possible without you either. <laughs> thanks, Helen. Everyone else, <laughs> thanks so much for joining us um, on, on the show today. And we'll see you soon. Bye, everybody. Bye.